Greetings everybody and welcome back to the Manifold series. Today we're going to be taking a look at charts in a little bit more detail. So in the previous video, the introduction video, I mentioned charts quite a few times. So roughly speaking, what is a chart? Well, it's just a way to give coordinates to small regions in our topological manifold. Because our manifold is a very abstract space still, we would wish to describe our very abstract space in a bit more of a concrete way using a list of numbers. So let's take a look at an example. We'll take the torus as our example. I always like drawing the torus over here. Let's say we select some points of P in our manifold here. So let's say this green here, this is the point of P in which I choose in our manifold. Then because it's locally Euclidean, that's the definition of a topological manifold, we should be able to find some kinds of open neighborhood around this P where we can map it to a small region of Euclidean space. And because torus is a two-dimensional manifold, we should be able to find a map, let's call it X over here, and we'll call that chart domain U, that takes us to a part of R2. And what we had our points P over here, maybe P gets mapped somewhere in this chart, and let's say it gets mapped over here. Now this point, that would be X of P. And X of P, that's now a coordinate, let's make up some numbers, that looks like 4, 3 for instance, so we could give it the coordinates 4, 3. But this is really just something I choose, it depends on what chart I pick. And we said last time that this X over here, that has to be a homeomorphism, so he wants this image in our Euclidean space to be a nice representation of what's going up in our manifold, which means it has to be invertible as well, so we can go back up from this chart here into the manifold via the map X inverse. So let's make a bit of a definition over here. So what's a chart? The chart has two pieces of information. First of all, you need to know what the chart's domain is. So that's going to be the U over here. And furthermore, you need to know what the chart's map is, which is X. So U, this is called the chart's domain. And this X over here, this is what we call the chart's map. And both of these together form what we know as a chart, which is just these two pieces of information. So charts give us coordinates to abstract points on our manifold. Now it's very important to realize that points on our very abstract manifold here still, they have no coordinates. For example, you could model the Earth as a sphere or a topological manifold, and you could say, well, different locations on the Earth or different cities whatsoever, they're just abstract points on this topological manifold. You could say, well, look at Sydney over here. Well, I see Sydney as a point on my manifold. Does Sydney have any coordinates? Well, the answer is no. That's a bit silly. You just don't look at Sydney and you see um, a pair of coordinates over there. However, we can describe Sydney using coordinates if we choose to look at a chart. So the Earth as it is, if we model it, it doesn't have coordinates yet, but if now you pull out a map of the Earth, which is essentially what a chart is, it's simply just a map of a small region of the Earth. So you could pull out a map over here and maybe um, here's Australia, let's say. And we'll put some um, Tasmania down here as well. And you say, oh, well, th there's Sydney over there. That is Sydney. And maybe using this chart, I could give Sydney some coordinates. Let's say um, 5, 2, for instance. So Sydney in this chart would have the coordinates 5, 2. That's how I choose to describe Sydney. Now, someone else or somewhere else might choose a completely different chart. Maybe they choose, maybe they're from New Zealand, right? So they want to um, include New Zealand some way in the chart and then a Australia would be um, sitting up over here, and maybe Sydney would be right over here. Well, this is their choice on the chart now. This is how they want to represent this very abstract manifold. And now Sydney has completely different coordinates. Maybe it has coordinates um, 3, 4. So the coordinates in which we give points on our very abstract manifold, they depend on the charts we use. They depend on how we want to represent points on our manifold. Right, so kind of like with that Sydney example over there, we have one chart which kind of covers that point P. We could also pick another chart that kind of covers that P as well, and the charts are allowed to overlap. So we might have a completely different coordinates system in this other chart, which I'll call, let's say, V, and then the chart map I'll call Y instead. So here's a map of Y, which takes us down into a subset of R2. So maybe it looks like um, this in some way, I don't know. And now this point P in which we're describing, it has a completely different coordinate. It could sit over here, so this point, this would be um, Y of P now. And this would have completely different coordinates. 
And of course, this chart map Y, that's a homeomorphism as well, which means there should also exist a nice and continuous inverse map Y inverse that takes us back into this manifold. So as you can see, if we take a look at points on our manifold as coordinates, it entirely depends on how we wish to view the manifold from different charts. So you might say, well, if one person wishes to view the manifold this way, and then here you have another person, this is their perspective on the manifold. Is there a way to nicely translate between these two representations here? And yes, there is. That's exactly called the chart transition map, which is a map that takes you from this domain over to here, provided that these two charts, the chart domain, slightly overlap a little bit over here, which are kinds of color in green. So this is the overlap, I'm not too sure if you guys can see that clearly, but there is some kind of overlap between those two charts. And in these local Euclidean spaces here, you could think about these overlaps as being right over here, let's say. So here are the overlaps. So in particular, what we call the chart transition map takes us from this small little overlap here into another overlap region. So what exactly is this map? Well, to go from this chart to over here, first of all, we have to go up via X inverse, and then we're in this intersection here, and then we can map down via the map Y. So this is precisely Y after X inverse, and this is what we call the chart transition map. So I'll make it a little bit more clear over here. So now we have what we call the chart transition map, or just a transition map for short. So a chart transition map, you need two charts that are slightly overlapping. So you could have chart domains U and V. So you take a look at the intersection here. Then what you do is you map down via X and via Y as well into these nice local Euclidean spaces. So you get something like X of U intersect V. And then you also have Y of U intersect V. And both of these guys over here are definitely a subset of R to some dth power, or R to the dim m, the dimension of the manifold. And then you have you know, this over here, so it's subsets of R to the dim m, and the transition map just takes you between these two spaces over here. And notice that this map Y after X inverse, this is just a map between Euclidean spaces, which is nice. And I'll just emphasize over here, we're just assuming that this U intersect V is not equal to the empty set. And now here's some key observations about chart transition maps. First of all, chart transition maps, these are homeomorphisms. Now, why are they homeomorphisms? Well, it's because you're composing a homeomorphism, Y, this chart map, with X inverse, which is also a homeomorphism. And the composition of homeomorphisms is indeed a homeomorphism. So chart transition maps are homeos, which means that they are continuous as well. So they are continuous. And continuous, you could also describe it as being C0. So C0 is how we talk about a map being continuous. And if the chart transition maps over here, if these are continuous, or in other words, there's C0, then there's a bit more terminology. What you say is that U, X, so this is one chart, and V, Y, this is the other chart, these are C0 compatible which simply means that they work well with each other at the level of continuity. So in some future videos where we start taking a look at differentiability, we might not only require that these two charts here are C0 compatible, I mean, every single chart is C0 compatible because they're all continuous, we might impose some extra conditions on this compatibility. For example, we might require that they're C1 compatible, which means that they are once continuously differentiable. Or it might even require that they're C infinity compatible, which means they're infinitely many times differentiable or smooth. So we'll take a look at the implications of those restrictions in future videos, but I might as well mention it now. We say that in two charts, u, x and v, y are CK compatible if their transition map is actually CK. And notice the transition maps are always maps between Euclidean spaces, so we know exactly what it means for a map to be CK. So if we have two charts that are overlapping slightly and their transition function is CK, then those two charts, we say that they are CK compatible because they work nicely with each other at the level of K times differentiability. Okay, so that's essentially what chart transition maps are. It just gives us a way to transform one coordinate system into another coordinate system on our manifold. And I think I'll wrap up today's video with the idea of coordinate functions, which are closely related to charts. So what exactly is a coordinate function? 
Well, notice what exactly are charts to begin with. The charts are simply just a map, let's say X, that takes you from a subset of your topological space into some region in Euclidean space or R to some deep power. Now, sometimes you want to extract a certain component, let's say the first component or the second component, for instance. That's exactly what these coordinate functions do. So coordinate functions, we represent them by X, and then we put an index up I here. So just be careful that I, even though it looks like a power, it's not a power. We put an up index so it's compatible with Einstein's sum notation when we work with yeah, vectors and covectors and whatnot later. So coordinate functions, we always put an up index. And coordinate functions, these are a map from you, so your subset, just like with the map above. But instead of taking you to R to some deep power, it simply takes you to a singular real number, and that's just a particular component. So how do you define this? Well, you take a point P, and what you do is, first of all, you need to map it to X of P, which is, for example, over here. You need to grab the coordinates first, so you take X of P, but then you only care about the ith components. So to do that, you just apply the projection function, so you project onto the ith component of X of P, and that's exactly what your coordinate function does. So for example, if X of P is equal to four comma three, then you could guess what X one of P is equal to. It's just equal to four because you extract out the first component and similarly X two of P that would give you three. So coordinate functions, they give you a particular number, which is just a component. And yeah, every single chart has a bunch of coordinate functions associated with them. In fact, there's dim m and many coordinates functions because your charts map x over here gives you yeah, dim m many real numbers. So I should have written, yeah, dim dim m over here gives you dim m many real numbers and that's the exact same information carried by dim m many coordinate functions so if you have a chart map x the information that it carries is equivalent to the information carried by dim m many coordinate functions so x1 all the way up until x to the dim m over here right so that's basically all for this video charts are just a way to give your very abstract manifolds, points on your manifold, or small enough regions on your manifold, nice coordinates so we can actually talk about them in terms of numbers. And it's important to note that points on your manifold, they don't have coordinates to begin with. These are just very abstract points. They only get coordinates once we employ a chart and their coordinates depends on what charts we pick. And depending on how you pick the charts, what your charts might overlap a bit, you might want to transition between them. That's exactly the transition maps that we had over here. So in the next video, we're taking a look at atlases, which is what happens if you yeah, cover the whole manifold. This is something you should be able to do. You cover the whole manifold in these charts. You put all the charts together into one big set, and that's going to be called the atlas. And the atlas is what we're going to be using to define differentiability later on as well. So that's all for this video. Hope you guys enjoyed and yeah, up until the next one, hope you guys have a wonderful day and I'll see everyone in the next video. Bye bye.